Today, I'm giving you a lot of tips for wedding photography. These come from my 15 years of experience and 60 plus weddings every single year, which is uh, it's a lot. You lost your phone, life's a rolling stone on a broken roller coaster. Okay. Scream shit, move on, throw your hands up, move on. It's all good, today's your day. Woo! Time is filled with swift transition, put yourself in good position if you want. Things can go your way. Yeah. Ain't no time to smell the roses, gotta get to where to go. This the road's already been paid. Here I go, ready now. I'm coming for it, can't nothing stop me. I got some things I gotta do. Hey, 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 hey. I'm making a move. Study long, study wrong. Ain't nothing gonna happen on the song. Hello. Over lunch, Tim Marsh and I came up with a series, a number of wedding photography tips that I'm going to get to right now. They, there are, if you want to go more in depth in any of these specific tips, there are videos available on taylorjacksoncourses.com, which if you're watching this in July right now, there are 100 spots available at the, the founder rate, which is $6.58 a month if you sign up for the annual, which is the cheapest that my courses will ever get. So you can get literal access instantly to everything that I've ever created for that cost right now. So if you're interested, head over there. There are 100 spots available, so hopefully you can still get in one of those. Let's get to the let's get to the tips. Number one is to know your gear, and I think that this is a big piece of also posing. So if you feel like you're not posing, you're not connecting with your couples as well as you could be. I think the gear is a, a little wall that you can set up. That if you're constantly adjusting settings or you're switching lenses or camera bodies, and you have a rolly case with you, and it's just a lot lot of gear. I feel like the more you can simplify that, I've personally simplified it to that I just simply use an 85 millimeter lens for pretty much all of the day. And for me, that's kind of my happy place. I'm quiet, shy, introverted. I don't like to be too close to people. I don't need to be at 30 or 24 all day. So 85 is kind of my, my happy place. And while that might seem like a telephoto lens, you would be surprised with how much of the day you can actually cover with that lens. There's actually a video on my YouTube channel where I only use that lens for an entire wedding day. I do some some secret shots with the my wider lenses that I, I don't show, but everything in that video is for my 85. And if I was the, the groom of that wedding and I received that gallery, I would have been quite happy with it overall. So um, uh, maybe a testament to shooting with one lens and really getting technically dialed with it, knowing if it's maybe a lesser quality lens or even the the top quality Nikon lenses there are some lighting environments that you can put it in that it will give you some some defects overall some of those defects uh, or some of the ways that it, it shows the image actually creates uh, some sort of character for the photo some of them you don't want so you want to figure all that out before you actually get to your first wedding or your first shoot um, I would say engagement shoots are kind of my my test for most weddings that I'll test out new new poses and new strategies to getting images that I want and sometimes new lenses and just kind of figure out what's going to work on a wedding day so when I actually get to the wedding that I don't have to be experimenting a whole lot that I know what I'm after and a big piece for me this is maybe a, a, an additional tip is that I really do focus on the experience of the wedding day so I want my couple to have the best time I want them to be there to, to have a wedding and not just because they want to have an expensive photo shoot and I want to get them back to the day as fast as possible which means for me I'm usually I would say my couple sessions maybe 15 minutes maybe 20 minutes on if there's a few spots we can walk to or if it's a big dress and there's some logistical problems with walking um, but I would say overall like that that is more than enough time for me and I, I'm happy with that amount of time um, with wedding party same 15 20 minutes and family usually 15 minutes as well there'll be some more family tips here to how to speed that process up but overall that's kind of that if I have that 40 minutes or 45 minutes or whatever the math works out to on that uh, that that's all I really need to do everything I want and at that point I want the couple back to their day I want them enjoying cocktail hour I want to like I want them to enjoy the wedding that they spent money on having and, and the guests that came to see them so the more I can do that the less I can pull them away from that um, the more that I don't know that I'm just happier with it and I feel like the more my couples are happier with it as well. To maybe add one more one more piece to this, uh, if you are interested in learning off-camera lighting, one, I have an entire course on the Taylor Jackson course site that you can sign up for, uh, but two, if you, you can just go on YouTube and you can learn 
most of the basics when it comes to off-camera flash or even on-camera flash and it is important to know those and to experiment in the worst possible conditions so like walk around your house and try to make great photos because there's a pretty good chance that you're going to walk into a house like that and getting ready and you're gonna have to figure out how to make that look as good as it possibly can in uh, in camera with one flash on your camera or a flash off your camera or simply if it's if it's decent lighting by the windows figuring out how to pose people and how to basically use that ambient light as, as best as you possibly can. Number two is um, something that maybe kind of goes against what I've been showing, at least on YouTube. So I've been showing a lot of my use of the Nikon Z6, which is a camera that is an amazing camera. I've used it on YouTube for travel photography coverage and shoots that aren't kind of those once in a lifetime moments. I would be hesitant in this time when there are camera bodies that do an amazing job that have two card slots to use a camera body with one single card slot. So unfortunately the Nikon Z6 has one single card slot and there is a competitive product, Nikon, D780 that, that has two card slots. So that's what I'm personally going to be using this year uh, simply to alleviate my anxiety. I think it's very important with weddings to have backups of backups of backups of backups that you never want anything to go wrong. I think by having one card slot, well, there is a very, very slim, if even existing above 0.01% chance that something might go wrong with that card that I would much prefer uh, from just like my residual anxiety to have two cards always shooting inside that camera. Um, if you are shooting with a camera body with one card slot, the best possible practice is simply to never have that card leave your camera. So if that, if you're shooting an Icon Z6 or if you're shooting something like a Canon R, uh, you can load everything off by USB-C. Train's going by, it's like a little noisy. Uh, you can load everything off by USB-C, so you never actually have to remove the card to put in a card reader. That's when you're going to get failures if you're popping it in and out and putting it in different card readers and back in your camera. Um, that's the most likely chance for something to go wrong. So if you're able to just never have that happen and you just can plug it into USB-C and load everything onto your drives and back everything up um, and then keep that card as a, another backup, uh, that, that's kind of the best case. So if you're shooting one card slot, hopefully your camera has some sort of USB-C offload capability. Um, and I would be using that pretty much all the time. Otherwise, get two card slots if you possibly can. Uh, I would say backups kind of go to all things considered when it comes to weddings. One, the, the, the obvious thing is that you want a backup camera body. So it doesn't have to be the, the same quality as your camera body, but you want something that worst case, you show up to the getting ready and all of a sudden your shutter just goes out or something happens to the camera that you're not able to, to recover it. Uh, at that point, you can just switch to your second camera for the entire wedding day. So it has to be a camera that you're comfortable in shooting for an entire wedding day if, if it came down to it. I'm gonna bring this one step more even and it is actually backup clothing. So uh, I have backup clothes in my car, whether it's just a really hot day and you get really sweaty when you're out there doing photos. I'm always standing in the sun. My couples, usually I'm trying to put them in the shade. I'm always in the hot sun. I could use a change of clothes going into the reception when everything's nice and air conditioned once again. Um, the other thing is that if you're like running in between locations, you're like, oh yeah, I'd love that, that street hot dog. That sounds great. And you load up with mustard and all of a sudden, things just get out of hand. It's very nice to have that backup pair of clothing in your car and to not have to call up a friend to be like, hey, can you come and drop me off pants? Cause like I, I, I slipped and like I ripped my pants and I'm at a wedding and it's I look weird cause I'm the photographer. You can just get around that by just having backups in your car. Going even beyond that to backups of when you get home, uh, something that I'm very passionate about a lot and that I talk about a lot on this channel is simply how I back up my, my cards. So I'll run you through that process really quickly here. I get home from a wedding, I have two card slots, so I'm putting one of those cards in a card reader, uh, downloads a little bit faster. A tip at this point of the night, get faster cards that maybe they're a little bit more expensive, but they're gonna save you that half hour of downloading everything at the end of the night. And I will say that I download everything the night of the wedding, that I'm not letting that wait until the next morning that I want all my backups going overnight. So I download everything and I'd sit there and I watch it all download. Um, this is maybe, maybe next level anxiety for me, but I just want to make sure that everything is being just written to that hard drive. I do everything completely manually and I verify uh, manually that the files are there. I kind of do a spot check on a few different sections and I run a Mac. So if something went wrong, usually it's going to be a grayed out file. So once everything looks good, I put that on the main drive. So that is all transferring to the main drive. Uh, and I do that by going actually into the files, uh, into the folders, picking all the files up and dragging them into a main folder for each shooter of the day. So if I'm a photographer and, and Tim shooting with me and Marshall shooting with me, each of us are going to have our own individual 
little folders. And then beyond that, I also drag just the entire card, so the, like the, the root folder, just to a backup drive that I never even touch. So I have two drives connected to my computer at all times. One is just the simple straight backup, like the entire card, drag, drop. And then the working drive that I work from is just everything individually gone through and kind of verify that everything is in fact there. Um, this helps my anxiety a lot. I feel like to, to know that everything's backed up in two spots locally there is very, very helpful for me. And then before I go to bed, I actually use Smug Mug and I do the small JPEG. So I shoot raw plus JPEG in my camera. Maybe another side tip here is to, to make sure you're shooting raw inside your camera. Uh, so I shoot raw plus JPEG, basic JPEG, and I back all of those up to Smug Mug just to make sure that I have, again, another offsite backup. It's not too expensive. And I also use it sometimes for gallery sales as well when I need something that's super customizable. Um, otherwise, I actually use Pixie Set for my client delivery galleries, but to know that I have the card as a backup, that I don't erase that card until I've at least looked at the files to make sure like everything is there, that all the family photos are there and everything. And that's maybe that's a Tuesday, Tuesday thing. Um, but by that point, I have a backup on that card. I have a backup on that drive, another backup on the other drive, and then an offsite backup. And then I actually do outsourcing for my post-production. So I have a company that does everything. And what I do, they, they call as well. So what I do for that is uh, I drag everything into a Lightroom catalog and I build smart previews. It builds all the smart previews for every single file that we shot. And then I upload that. And usually uh, what a smart preview is, it's a DNG, which is kind of a modified raw or I guess it is a raw file uh, and what it does is it makes a smaller size raw file so it's very easy for me to just send that gallery out to someone so say we shot a hundred gigabytes of images on the day usually that gallery in smart previews is somewhere around six gigabytes I think it's like a, a six megapixel preview and at that point I actually have a raw a raw photo uh, like off-site backed up as well so I have essentially five tiers of backup just as soon as I get home from a wedding day by usually like maybe 2 a.m. the night of the wedding. So that, that helps me and I've never had any, any problems with that. And I feel like that is maybe it's overboard, maybe it's a couple steps overboard, but I would much rather do that when it comes to something as mission critical as actually keeping the files that you were, that you were hired to go out there to do of a once in a lifetime moment. Another thing that I recommend doing is learning on location lighting and learning how to deal with just weird and unusual lighting conditions. So rather than scheduling every single shoot that you ever do, if it's a for fun shoot with one of your friends, everyone always kind of gravitates towards like, oh, we're going to do it in golden hour because that's easy. And while that is easy, you don't really learn how to do a group shot at 12 noon in, in the bright sun. So uh, I would recommend getting out there and doing some shoots outside of the ideal times and hours. Um, over time, you will learn this while you're at weddings that you're just going be forced into weird and unusual environments where you have like three minutes before it's going to be a, a proper downpour from rain and it's really windy and you got to make it work within that time frame um, you'll learn those <laughs> those those uh, high pressure situations eventually but for now if you can just be learning simple ways to just find good shade and um, like how light bounces and the way to make good photos even is something that seems as simple like if you're looking for shade forest looks great we should go into a forest if you go too deep in that forest everyone's going to start getting that green tint to their skin and it's going to be really difficult for you to edit out so the easy solution to that that i discovered naturally i don't think that anyone ever told me now i'm telling you so hopefully you can just take this advice and, and use it but just keep people close to the opening of of a forest so if it's a big forest don't go too far in there to get the tree shots get kind of as close to the edge as you possibly can so when you're shooting it it looks like you're in a forest but you're getting all that good light from outside and you're not getting all that green bounce because it kind of makes everything just not so good um, open trees just kind of open shade just anywhere you can find it learning how to work with that and learning the direction to place people um, another way you can do that is just fire up selfie mode just walk into a space and just do a little circle and you can probably see in a few cases where that lighting is going to be the absolute best and now rather than making the couple do like a weird pivot dance with you while you're taking test frames you can just walk over there and do a quick little check and be like this is the spot you guys stand here i'll stand there and just get it done nice and quickly um, again client experience making that as easy and organic as possible next up another important thing is to make sure that everyone is on the same page so by getting a contract and having a contract there's actually one available on my taylorjacksoncourses.com website sorry to keep throw into that over and over again uh, but you can actually get my contract that is at least I live in Canada so it's 
good for Canada. Get your lawyer to check over to make sure that they're they're good with it as well. But uh, I would say it's pretty, as far as the legal terms and everything go, it's it's pretty good. I would say anywhere in the world. Obviously, customize it to specifics of your place. But it's a contract that I've been using, and a lot of other photographers around here have been using for many years now. And it really does kind of just cover everything that you could possibly ever run into in a wedding day and we've gone through all the problems and we've made the modifications based on that and to have a contract with all the terms and all your hours and everything just laid out is the best place to go into a wedding that they're not going to be expecting you to stay until midnight if the contract specifically says that you're there for 10 hours you start at noon done at 10. Uh, it's very simple like that and then also uh, just customer expectations as well that you can kind of be like hey like just confirming that I'm here for 10 hours and that we're in my case I do video as well sometimes and we're photography only and there's just one of me I have no second shooter on the day and you can have that all out before uh, that you actually show up on the wedding day because like the worst is that oh we thought we we got a second shooter but if you confirm that a couple of days before the wedding or two weeks before the wedding they'll they'll know that and they'll already have dealt with that as a thing if they thought they were getting it but for you to show up and for them to think that they were getting something that they weren't getting. Um, it's a very difficult way to start that relationship in the morning on the wedding day. So uh, I, I recommend just putting everything out, very simple terms that everyone can understand and make sure that everyone's on the same page before the actual wedding day. One thing that I did uh, when I was, again, first getting started is I would actually go and location scout every single wedding that I went to. So if we were doing photos, there's a place called Rockway Gardens. If we were doing photos at Rockway Gardens here, which uh, if you live locally, I might push against doing photos there because it's very it's very much like the the cliche kind of wedding garden and there's hundreds of people there now on on weekends that if I went there and I would go there the same time of day so if I knew our photo session was from 1 p.m. till 3 p.m. I would go there at 1 and I would look around and be like alright so the sun's here so if it's a sunny day this is what it's gonna look like if it's a cloudy day everything's easy and, and wonderful but if it's a sunny day this is what's gonna happen we're gonna have to kind of find this tree and then also I would kind of have a few different backup levels as well that I would have one as an ideal spot but knowing that there's lots of other weddings there I don't want to bring my couple within like 50 yards of another couple so if we're doing wedding photos I'm gonna find another spot to kind of keep out of just immediate view of another wedding so to have multiple different backup spots that you can take them to one gives you better, better variation on the actual wedding day and then also overall just makes your job easier on a number of levels that you're able to just kind of handle everything and then also you look like an all-star to your to your couple because you're like hey i've already pre-scouted this and they're like what you, you came here to, to figure out where we're gonna do photos like that's awesome so uh that's what i did for the first long time at some point i would say maybe after 20 30 weddings you've pretty much discovered most of the problems that you could find as far as just bad lighting in the middle of the afternoon and you can solve most of those problems. So I would say at that point I kind of started not really going to too many location scouts unless it was somewhere that I'd never been and that it looked like it was going to be very challenging. But um, that would be something that I would definitely recommend doing for the first little bit. Uh, rolling another thing in that I used to do a lot uh, or that I did for every single wedding was doing uh, an actual shot list that was for me. So it wasn't something that the bride and groom gave me, although you can collaborate on this. But it was just a personal shot list and it also included some sample uh, some sample photos of couples like doing poses and whatnot so that i was able to actually be like okay i'm stuck for ideas we're gonna do this now and i would have an immediate solution and i wouldn't just stand there and be like oh like what do you guys want to do now uh, and I was able to come up with solutions like that. It was a simple, actually, I'm, there's going to be a video uh, in a couple of days coming out that's going to include my checklist, and it's for free. So if you're only watching this on YouTube and you're not part of the Taylor Jackson Courses site as a member, um, you can still have access to this. But uh, it's just a, a, a list of kind of every shot that I would typically get on a wedding day. Another tip I have, again, no, no specific order to these. I feel like there needs to be like some sort of like commercial break or something for something. Maybe, well, here, here's a bit of a song. Gear lost, gear lost. Gear lost, gear lost. Gear lost, gear lost. Gear lost, gear lost. I've got class, but it's not in the cupboard. Full kit, every focal length is covered. New lens, boca, boca, bocal. Gear's worth more than my con. Now that's over, we can get back to the, the content. I felt like it was a lot of, it's a podcast all of a sudden. It's a video, video podcast. Hopefully there's a lot of value in here though, so hopefully you're enjoying the video podcast. Uh, my next tip that I have is uh, when you're asking for the schedule of the day, which usually I figure out maybe with a couple 
two weeks before the wedding, so not like months and months and months before the wedding. Uh, two weeks before the wedding, usually we email back and forth. This is also for me and it's in my contract as well, uh, that this is when the, the second payment's due, the final payment is due. So at that point, we figure out all of what's going, like officially what's gonna happen on the day. If we try to set it up too early, like there's just gonna be a lot of back and forth actually leading up to the wedding day. Uh, and we're gonna have to make modifications. Two weeks out, usually everything's pretty much set in stone. I also ask, um, this is something that I didn't do for a long time. I had the bride and groom's phone number usually, or the groom and groom of bride and bride, but I'd never really had a bridesmaid or groomsman phone number. And I realized very quickly that if you ever want to get in touch with a bride on the wedding day, her phone number is not the one usually that's the easiest to get to get in touch with. So have a maid of honor or a best man's phone number that you can easily get in touch with or send some text messages back and forth. Um, I find this specifically if maybe the guys are getting ready at a very strange, that's my, my dog Richard. Um, he's over here now. Uh, that if they're getting married in a strange and unusual environment uh, or a place that you've never been before, or maybe they're getting ready at an Airbnb, but it's like the rear entrance and you go downstairs or something like that, it's nice to just have somebody that you can just text message and be like, hey, I'm at the spot, but uh, where are you, you guys at? I don't hear anyone yet. Um, that's another thing. If you show up to a spot and you don't, you don't know where you're going, you can usually just listen. <laughs> and regardless of what side of the wedding uh, is there, you can usually hear them and you can usually just, just find your way there. So um, that might a bonus, a bonus tip. These tips aren't numbered because there's going to be, there's going to be a lot of them. All right, another tip, and this might be one of the more important and un exciting tips that I might have for you today. And um, it is to make sure you get insurance for your business, uh, that it is very, very important. There's a lot of venues around here that will actually ask for proof of insurance. The last for, uh, some of them are a million liability. Some of them are 2 million liability, uh, just to verify that you are in fact a real business, uh, just in case you walk into a room and you happen to break something or whatever it might be, make sure that you're covered. There's all kinds of different levels of insurance when it comes to gear. Um, for me personally, I have coverage in the United States of America and Canada. So I live in Canada, United States I'm covered in anywhere else in the world. I am not covered in, and I am very aware of that whenever I'm traveling. Uh, usually when we're traveling for really anything, I've kind of geared down to the minimum that I need, but I'm very aware that I'm not insured once I go out of those, out of the realm of, of this continent, not including Mexico, I guess. Uh, so get the insurance that makes the most sense for you. If you know you're going to be shooting a lot of destination weddings, you might want to go for that worldwide insurance. Uh, destination weddings are another, I guess, as far as my anxiety goes, uh, another difficult thing. My, I used to, what I used to do, so now most resorts have Wi-Fi and you can back up all the JPEGs. Uh, and then what I'll do is I'll usually take a card or put it on a hard drive and bring it to usually kind of a maid of honor, best man to just put that in their safe in their room as well. So I have a backup of everything there and a backup in my room. The cards that I'll usually put in my uh, wallet or whatever is gonna be coming with me, my beach bag uh, to absolutely everywhere. And so that I have, I have a lot of backups going and then I will do the JPEG backup and sometimes that'll take a day or two to actually get up there. Uh, what I used to do is I used to put everything on either a burned CD when our computers used to have CD drives uh, or USB and I would actually mail it. I would FedEx it or whatever was on the, usually on the resort they have some sort of mailing system uh, and I would just mail it back to myself so that I knew absolute worst case I lose everything that there's those files are on their way back to me at home and I can just get them in the mail. So that's my, again, next level anxiety of backups. For insurance though, it is very important that you have, uh, it's also very important that you actually create a real business um, and that you start, like I, I feel like if you're here and you've made it this far into a video, you're pretty serious about making this a career. And the earlier you put everything together and you make it legitimate, the the more organic the, the process is going to be. Uh, for us in Canada, there's kind of two levels. You can be a sole proprietor, which I ran for a couple of years. And then I, I knew, I'm gonna say three years before I made the switch that I should have changed to um, an actual incorporation or I think an LLC is the equivalent in the States. And I knew this for a long time, but it's just such a hard shift to make. So I wish I would have just kicked myself and just done that a heck of a lot faster. Um, the benefit, I guess, of becoming an incorporation or potentially an LLC, um, I believe this to be, to be true as well, uh, that you basically, I guess it is an LLC, limited liability company. So essentially what you're doing is you're making your business a standalone entity. So if you were to get sued, if you were to accidentally burn down a wedding venue and they were to come after you, they can only come after you for what's, what's actually in your business, that they're not going to come after you for your house and like all your family stuff. So, um, that's kind of the, again, like to, to relax a little bit of anxiety, uh, to run a proper business. I feel like at some point you do kind of have to make that leap. The first year when you're shooting a couple of weddings, not a big deal, but once you start to do significant volume, I think it is important, uh, very important to make that shift. 
I don't think anything will ever happen, but also if I get called in to do a commercial job for somebody and it's a big company that there's again, more liability and more things that could go wrong with that, especially if it's something I do a lot of work that's under NDA. So if something were to somehow get out or whatever it might be, I would rather just have my company be liable overall for that rather than having my entire life uh, vulnerable to a situation like that. So um, maybe that's kind of the, I would say that's probably the biggest tip this entire video so if you if you got that hopefully i put that in your ear and hopefully that's something that you're going to uh consider in in the future to to get done and to do it properly and then to figure out what your insurance needs are and, and how to structure that all right we got a few few more tips sorry if the uh the lighting is changing i've set my camera to automatic mode so that i'm actually able to uh to not keep changing as the clouds come and go here today on the balcony the next thing is comfy shoes uh this is something that took me I found them last year and I've been doing this. I think this is my 15th or 16th year in wedding photography. I found comfortable dress shoes. I guess this is for guys. For girls, I feel like you can get away with a little bit more. For guys, um, I truly believe, and maybe this is another tip, that you should dress well if you're going to a wedding. Don't wear jeans, even if they're black jeans. Don't wear, um, like even something like this, if I was at maybe a destination wedding, I might consider wearing this as long as it was tucked in with um, nice, usually long pants, even if I'm at a destination wedding and I know it's hot. Um, but dress shoes were something that I never really found a, a comfortable alternative to as a guy that I would love to wear Vans to a wedding, but I just simply do not recommend that and you should not do that either. But I found dress shoes that are actually um, comfortable running shoes kind of underneath. Uh, it's from a company called Soft Mock in Canada. I'm sure you can find them somewhere else. Now that I know that they exist, I'm sure that there are other places as well. But on the top, they're a dress shoe. On the bottom, they're just kind of a rubber sole running style shoe. So it's um, the most comfortable shoe I've ever found for wedding days. And I found it last year. So um, if you're watching this and this is your first year into the wedding industry, that is my, my biggest tip for you. My biggest tip for just general comfort. And hopefully that um, will make watching this video worth it just to save yourself the, the hours and hours of agony and the three day recovery period uh, after the for, like your first wedding of the year. And now everything is just comfortable. Um, and again, to stress again, bringing backup clothes, bring up, bring up backup everything, backup cards, backup. If you hire a second photographer, make sure they have backups. So now you have four tiers of backup equipment. If anything were to happen, if they drive separate, you got a backup car, backups, backups backups. All right, we've got a few more, a few more tips. Thanks for sticking with me this, this far into the video. Uh, if you're introverted like me, um, I would say the biggest thing for me was to ask, um, specifically when it comes to, to the family section of the day, it becomes a little challenging for me to just like yell out and be like, all right, where's the, where's the Ross family? Like everybody get in line. Everybody, I can't really do that. I don't feel comfortable doing that. So I pass that off to somebody and I pass it off in a nice way. So during the first meeting or the first phone call, whatever it might be, usually what I'm doing is I'm telling my couples that like, Hey, it would be really nice to have somebody that's able to just somebody that knows who everyone is. So maybe a sister or um, maybe like a cousin or somebody that's not going to be in all the photos that they can help do traffic direction of the day and they can get the next family on deck. It speeds things up a heck of a lot of time faster. I'm losing, losing my words in this video podcast. It speeds things up a lot. And it also just makes sure that I guess you have a, another level of somebody just looking over that list. So I do ask my couples for a list of family photos if I know they have a larger family. And what they do is they put that on a piece of paper. I asked for that piece of paper to come to me and then also a piece of paper to go to somebody that knows who everyone is. And that speeds my life up a lot. If you're at a more high-end wedding where it might seem inappropriate to ask one of the actual attending guests to, uh, to do this, Usually if you're in kind of that tier of weddings, there's going to be a wedding planner and there's a pretty good chance that the wedding planner will have an assistant if you're in a wedding like that as well. So they're able to, to kind of help facilitate that and to take that stress off of you. Um, I found, I, I think as the years go, so my first few years, I would say that they're the hardest weddings to do because you're just, you have to constantly be problem solving with everything. And as an introverted person, I find that my tank of just being social gets depleted very, very quickly. So in the first few years, it was very difficult for me to, to come home from a wedding and have any energy. It was very much come home, collapse, sleep for like the next day and have the, the wedding hangover like all Sunday and all Monday. Um, but as I've kind of done this and as I've realized that that is a piece of the day that that stresses me out and makes me spend a lot of my internal 
memory or effort, I guess, of the day. I don't know. Is there, is there a tank? Uh, but as that gets depleted, it's much easier for me to just have somebody that knows who everyone is to call those out. And that makes my life a lot easier. And that makes that part of the day just like I just get to take the photos. I can offer slight suggestions. I pose people kind of where I want them to be. But other than that, everything just doesn't mentally affect me a whole lot. So that's um, a positive tip if you're maybe a little bit more shy, quiet, introverted like I am. A few more tips. Uh, another one that I'm sure you're already aware of is to always push for that sunset session with the couple. Um, I pre-coach this in the first meeting or the first phone call to make sure that they know that I want to borrow them for that, again, like 15 minutes uh, during sunset, during golden hour. And sometimes this means that if we're in a venue and there's nothing pretty around that we're doing that session in the parking lot. But if you're shooting on the 85 millimeter lens at 1.4, 1.8, you make a lot of that background disappear. And as long as you have that nice warm wraparound light, you're going to create a lot of images that you actually really, really love. So um, that's something that I put in the, the first meeting simply so that they know to expect that so it doesn't get left out of the actual schedule and that they're not surprised when I come up and ask them to do that while they're just like finishing up having their salad course or whatever it might be on the wedding day. A few other random sort of tips. When the bridesmaids are all, all lining up, getting ready to come down the aisle for the ceremony. Usually at some point before that, I'll usually kind of be in that room to just grab a few candidates and I'll remind them like, hey, don't forget, walk slow and just be generally happy while you're coming down the aisle because it's so easy for people to just like get nervous. They're like in tall heels that maybe they're not used to and like coming down the aisle, like the people will be kind of the smiling like that and they'll just walk incredibly fast and I'll get the photos, but they won't be photos that they're going to be happy with. And if they just slow down, they relax and just like calmly walk down the aisle and just have like a nice and just like looking at friends and whatnot. Um, that makes for a much nicer photo overall. And if you're doing video coverage, like you almost kind of need that. Otherwise there's, there's, it's very difficult if you get people looking angry in a video that it's hard to kind of include that in a final edit. So again, just like relaxing, smiling, having a good time, walk nice and slow, take your time. Um, and then another tip, this goes for actual like the formals as well. So when we're doing bridal party photos as well as when they're coming down the aisle, um, people have a tendency to kind of hide behind their flowers. So if they have a bouquet of flowers, they're kind of like coming down the aisle like this, uh, get them to just kind of relax the stems and kind of stems in, in the belly button area is usually my recommendation. And when you do that one, for the most part, people kind of like relax. I feel like when you're like this, you're very tense. and as you come down here, you kind of relax a little bit. Uh, so I feel like that's kind of one of the positive things. And then also it just makes like that if you have any dress detail up here and most dresses do, uh, especially for the bride, that if they are hiding that with flowers, it's just not gonna be the best photo. They're not gonna be the happiest with it. Uh, and then during uh, photos of the girls or photos of the full bridal party, another thing that I do is I also make sure that one, that they're kind of all belly button level, but then that they've also matched with all the other flowers as well. So if somebody's a little bit taller, that their flowers aren't kind of like it's not like this, that everybody's just nice and nice and even. Uh, again, that's for just kind of the basic, like I look for that. It's in the, I guess, in the checklist that's gonna come out in a few days, but I look for those basic images first and I wanna make sure that I 100% have those because those are kind of those, those quintessential images that will never get old, that they'll always end up printed somewhere or on somebody's Facebook page, I guess now maybe, or up on a mantle or whatever it might be. It's always going to be that just like that clean cut, image that's going to kind of just stand the test of time. So I always make sure that I create it regardless of how many other cool photos we're off doing. Um, this also goes with the, the bride and groom or the bride and bride and groom and groom um, that in the checklist, you'll see that there are a few images that are specifically highlighted because they are the only images that I believe on the wedding day that you, that you cannot miss. And those are just the simple arm around each other, smile, face the camera, just looking good, feeling relaxed, flowers, belly button level not covering the dress um, full length, half length or three quarter length maybe. Uh, and then also the back of that as well to show off kind of the entire dress. Um, those are kind of like the, the only images that I would say are the 100% required images from a wedding day. And this even includes like the first kiss. Like I feel like if you miss the first kiss, um, one, there are creative ways to maybe get around that. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you about that in a second. But um, two, like th if you miss that, ah, that's, that's fine. If you miss the photo of them smiling, facing the camera, arm around each other, you're gonna hear from the mom, you're gonna hear from the grandma, you're gonna hear from the other side's mom, you're gonna hear from the other side's grandma, you're gonna hear from absolutely everyone. Why didn't you get this photo? Uh, so just make sure you get it. Uh, the way that I've creatively, one time that I, it, it really did come out of nowhere, Catholic ceremonies as well. Um, if you can meet with the priest or whoever is officiating before the, the ceremony and just ask them, hey, like, when is the first kiss? Because sometimes long Catholic religious ceremonies, it will come out of nowhere. Like 
in Canada, they we all sit down and we sign the papers on the stage for some reason. So like as as they're getting married, like hey, like photo op, smiling, s- signing things has been weird. Uh, but when they stand up from that, sometimes they just do the first kiss like right then, and it's really fast, uh, and they're kind of a little bit nervous to, to kiss in front of a church, in front of like everything that's going on. Um, so that's usually a very fast first kiss. I've I believe I've caught, or maybe I've missed one or two of those. I've done, I'm gonna say like close to a thousand weddings at this point, but my second photographer has always managed. If I've, if I've missed it, my second photographer misses it a lot of the time as well. Um, so usually one of us gets it one single time. Uh, I missed it and I guess my second photographer missed it as well, uh, that it did come out of nowhere. It wasn't a Catholic ceremony, it wasn't a long ceremony, but it was just a first kiss that was just really, really fast. Um, and we just weren't in the right spot for it and there was no lead up to it either. It was kind of like the, the pre, like just kind of covers the mic and just whispers for them, you, you can kiss now. Uh, and they did it and we both were just in the process of walking. We like both turned and tried to, tried to get it. We didn't get it. So what we did was we actually um, brought them back up uh, during the photo session to the same spot and we did the first kiss and then I put it in the in their, their gallery in the center so I feel a little bit bad about it but now that I've admitted it to you maybe maybe I feel less bad but there are there, there are subtle ways around it if you ever do miss something like that um, I think that it's very infrequent that anything like that could happen especially now cameras are very fast and you can also work in very less than ideal lighting situations and in that case specifically the reason that the that are like usually if you turn around you just snap a photo it's somewhat usable in that case it was just very very challenging because it was maybe it was over 10 years ago now um, and camera technology just wasn't there so it was a little bit dark and then you didn't have the dynamic range in your file to actually bring it up so I saved one of the black and whites but I, I couldn't really make it like a great image so by doing it again and just kind of telling them that hey like this is the situation sorry guys uh that they were pretty cool with it so um yeah maybe a maybe a note to you if you're if you're worried about missing those like decisive moments um that you don't always have to be as worried as you think that uh, a bride and groom might be upset at you that uh, there are like people are pretty chill and pretty cool on their actual wedding day another tip i have is to get a 70 to 200 which is a big zoom lens um 2.8 for the actual ceremony if even if you go and pre-scout something, there's a good chance that the lighting just might not be the same if you're in a dark church, a dark environment, um, or a dark hall. Like It's going to be very difficult for, for you to get the shots that you need without being too obtrusive to the actual wedding ceremony. Um, again, one of my big things is that I don't want to be the center of attention, especially during the ceremony. So if I have that 70, 200, 2.8, I know that I can zoom around, that I don't have to be like running to get into a new spot to get that shot with my 85 prime, um, that I can rely a little bit on the zoom to kind of get the shots that I need. And then depending on which camera system you're using, Nikon, um, I'm very familiar with because I've been using it my entire career. I've actually set, there's a front button kind of like right down here that puts me into crop mode. So I have a full frame camera. Um, and when I hold that, I can scroll the back wheel and I can pop into crop mode. So if I'm on a 7200, I'm all the way to 200 and I'm not quite at the crop that I want yet. Uh, I can hit that button, go into crop mode. I lose some of the megapixels, but I basically am just shooting the final image that I want to deliver. Um, if I'm able to zoom into 300 or something like that to get the shot that I want. So um, overall, I that's kind of how that I do it. I, w- I want to make sure that everything that I'm shooting, I don't really care to go into post-production and crop. I outsource everything. So it would be, again, another step. If I can just shoot that crop correctly in camera, um, I'm much happier to do that. So maybe that's another another bonus tip outside of all, all the tips that you're, that you're getting today. A few more random sort of tips. Uh, to get sharp group photos, if you've watched any of my full behind the scenes wedding days on YouTube, you might notice that I shoot a lot of the, uh, the actual group photos with a lot of people at something like 2.8 if I'm on my 70 to 200. Uh, I would recommend maybe don't do that at the very beginning, that something like F4 or 5.6 or even F8 if you're a little bit nervous about making sure everybody's nice and crisp and in, in focus. What I do is I'm very conscious that everyone's eyes are kind of on the same focal plane. So I don't really pose people like I won't move hands and I won't like pose everything to a T, but what I will do is I'll get people to move small distances forward so that they're all properly in focus along the same focus plane. Um, Photography basics, like your focus point, unless you're using a tilt shift, is kind of a straight line. Anyone on that straight line is gonna look good as long as it's a high quality lens. If there's people out towards the edges and it's a lesser quality lens, you might run into some blur or something weird happening out there. But for the most part, as long as everyone's on a good focal plane, um, everyone's good. If we add a second layer to that, usually that's when I go down to f5.6 to make sure that it's nice and crisp all the way through there. Uh, And then your focal distance also comes into play there too. So if you're shooting 
at something like 200, your depth of field is going to become very, very small. But if you walk a little bit closer or you put a 35 millimeter lens or a 50 millimeter lens on your camera, um, you're gonna be able to have a little bit more depth of field to make sure that like every single person that photo is nice and in focus. And you can also set your center button on the back of your camera, um, like the D-pad or um, even pressing down on the stick. You can usually set that to be 100% crop check on wherever the focus point was. So you can take the photo and then just quickly like hit that and it'll just show you 100%. And you can be like, good, and like next photo. So um, that's something that really kind of helped me. Uh, there there was a time, I feel like now again, with the, the, the increasing goodness of camera technology uh, that it happens less and less, but there was a period of time where you had to make sure that all of those photos were sharp. Um, so if you're using glass, maybe from that era, like 2010 era or 20, 2005 era, um, know that there is a little margin for error. So make sure that you're checking and, and making sure that everything is, is nice and good throughout. Um, another maybe bonus tip outside of this, I have a video if you're a Nikon shooter um, that actually shows you how to go in and autofocus fine tune. If you're buying a new prime or you're buying a new zoom lens, and you're noticing that like things are just a little bit soft, you can actually go into your settings, depending on your camera, most cameras can do it, and you can actually autofocus fine tune. So if for instance, um, a few of my lenses, if I focus, if I was to focus right on my eye here, the actual focus point would be somewhere like right here. And I can just bump that back a little bit so that I can make everything um, a lot better. If you're shooting a mirrorless camera like this camera here, um, you should have no problems with that, that it, it knows what a face is, it knows what an eye is. But if you're on digital SLR still, um, there is kind of that margin of error that you can go in and you can you can manually change on your own. Another thing for group photos, I would recommend 100% to take a lot of them to overshoot that group photo section, uh, simply because if people are blinking or people are moving and it's if there's 10 people or even two rows of 10 people, 20 people in front of you, it's very difficult to visually ID that like everyone is, yes, everyone is looking at the camera right now. I'm gonna hit the shutter right now. Um, so what I do is I usually just, while I'm talking, be like, all right guys, everybody look over here, that I'm already taking photos with my hand up or whatever it might be. Um, another weird tip, if, if you're a female shooter watching this, this is an unfortunate um, thing that just society still does, is that if you're a female shooter, I would probably recommend putting the biggest, stupidest lens that you can find on your camera um, so that everybody actually identifies you as a lead shooter. Uh, my wife, Lindsay, with the, struggles with this, that if Lindsay and Tim shoot a wedding together and Lindsay's the main shooter and she's the one doing all the communication on the day, people still direct every single question they have to Tim because he's a dude. Um, you can do this by doing the stupid thing of putting more gear on your camera to make it look bigger. Um, it's like, is actually the solution that she's kind of found to that, which is not a great solution and the world really does need to change about that a little bit. But uh, in the meantime, that's kind of the workaround to, um, to a, a, a much higher level uh, situation than just weddings. But uh, that's kind of one of the, the things that I would recommend. And also if you are a female shooter, you're watching this and you're just like annoyed the fact that like the, every single guy at the wedding, every single person, when they have a question, they're gonna go up to your male second shooter to ask them. Um, just know that that's unfortunately just a normal thing. So um, sorry that you have to deal with that, ladies. But yeah, okay. put, the, put the bigger lens on for the family photos and usually you'll get a little bit more attention, which is sad, but unfortunately true. Another tip I have is to get photos of everyone. So when you're going into a wedding, specifically like anytime that I find that there's good light, I do absolutely everything that I can to make sure that I'm taking as many images in that lighting situation as possible, which means candidates of pretty much everyone that I can possibly see. I make kind of a mental note of anyone sitting in the front two rows of the ceremony to make sure that I capture maybe a few additional images of all of them on their own. But otherwise, it is really kind of the cocktail hour goal to make sure that you get that photo of everyone or you get a photo of everyone or at least involving everyone. Um, Tim is, his, is great when it comes to weddings because he'll actually go around cocktail hour and he'll find groups of people and be like, hey, can you guys just get together for a quick photo? Um, which is not something that I'm really comfortable doing. I can do it if I have to, but if Tim's there and he's able to do that, that's a much better solution overall. Um, so he just he just likes to go around and just get people to, and like when you walk up to somebody and you have a camera and you're obviously the photographer, they kind of, they get the thing that's about to happen. So they get together, they smile, they face the camera and you come home with an image essentially of everyone and with that also groups of people and when they see a photographer out doing that a lot of families will kind of come together and be like hey can you just grab like a quick family group shot of us and you really over deliver on every tier of your wedding experience when you do that because one you're getting all the images for the actual couple and for like everything that they would have expected but then two 
every single family, every single couple that's at that wedding as well is very excited to have you as a photographer because you've actually given them images and you've actually taken their images and you're making them easy to find up on a gallery website that they can download for free and the couple's already paid the money so you don't need to get more money from them. Um, I feel like that's the way that you really kind of do accelerate your referrals and those referrals surprisingly will come from everywhere that it'll be like a friend of a friend that tells somebody that inquires with me and it's like hey like you shot a wedding that this person was a guest at and they said like check you out for whatever reason and that's kind of the weird random way that I guess wedding photography referrals work so make sure you're getting photos of everyone if you can be getting photos of all the couples there that's even better if you have somebody like Tim that's that's cool with going out and just doing all that and during cocktails like really just covering the entire room um, it's worth it's worth finding somebody that does that uh, just to just to have with you if you are somebody that um, just kind of naturally can't do that or if um, for I guess like in most instances I can't do it because I'm out usually with the couple and the wedding party doing those uh, photos so maybe maybe another tip outside of that is that if you are doing kind of that family session that you don't need two photographers there usually um, that it's nice to have somebody around to grab those quick candids of everyone because all the families in one spot which is great but as soon as kind of that sections over I don't really need a second photographer with me to do all of the other photos so I would much prefer I feel like they create much more value if they're at cocktails and they're doing those photos of all the couples and all the family members and everybody that's there um, kind of all together and I feel like that brings you much more referrals in the future. Richard's uh, breathing breathing deep here on this on this summer day. Another tip that I have uh, is when it comes to actual marketing images so if you are looking at basically creating as many relationships as possible with different vendors if you're out there and you're shooting images like if you walk into a new venue and you spend maybe you show up a half hour early and you shoot that venue like you were hired to do a commercial shoot there of the venue for like a real estate magazine uh, if you come home with all those images you're able to give those images to the venue um, and then I'll also do usually a lap of this during if everyone's sitting down having dinner like I'll just hop outside and just get those nice golden hour shots of the venue as well um, because I know that that's going to be an opening that could potentially create a relationship that might make me a preferred vendor eventually at that venue so that's um, a huge thing I think that's critically important that a lot of us overlook and then it also comes down to just like every single person that's involved with the wedding day that um, Usually, I guess, like, you'll run into a lot of people in person, but to also have their names in email or I have space for them on my contract that it'll ask for who your florist is, who your officiant is, so I can actually reach out to them and be like, hey, here's, like, a Mr. Officiant. Here's some photos from the wedding day. I hope that you enjoy. Please tag me on Instagram if you upload them. And I'm not too harsh in policing my upload tag, so if somebody doesn't tag me, it's not like, ah, I'm angry. I'm, like, they're cut off forever. It's more so they know who took that photo, and if they're uploading it, they're probably in, in some way at least thinking about me or thinking about like, hey, like that was really rad that this guy actually just like out of nowhere sent me photos because I know we all like that that's a very basic thing. You go to a wedding, you take photos of, for the makeup artist, you take photos for the hairstylist and you send them all out, but no one ever does. So um, by collecting those emails in a way that you can just easily reach out to them or easily tag them on Instagram or whatever, or send them over Instagram if you want. Um, really does make things a heck of a lot easier. Um, another thing, rather than business cards on the actual wedding day, I usually just get people to, to where we can just add each other on Instagram. Um, and I found that that makes a much better long-term relationship than giving somebody a piece of paper. Um, I haven't had business cards in a long, long time. I'm gonna say seven years, I haven't had business cards. I think that my business is doing okay. So if you're like stressed out about not having business cards, know that I also don't have business cards. Richard the Bulldog over here also doesn't have business cards. We're almost, we're almost through this here. All right, the last tips are going to condense into, I guess they're not really that long. So one, pretty simple. If you're delivering a black and white image to a couple, also give them the color, unless there is an absolute reason that you cannot deliver that color photo. Uh, a lot of my just meaningless in like back and forth emails are just people like, hey, you gave us this photo, can I also have it in color? Um, we're trying to put like together a magazine or like a, an album spread, and it looks weird that that's the only black and white image. And so now I just give everyone any image that I convert to black and white, they get the color as well. If you're shooting film, maybe, maybe this is a thing that you m might have to tell your clients before, but if you're shooting digital, just give them both, unless there is a reason if the color is just like absolutely atrocious and like too much is going on, but it makes a great black and white photo or if there's just some technical issue that might have happened that you save the image by converting it to black and white in that case maybe it's fine but for the most part give them both if you can two more 
Two more tips. Tip. Second from last. It's getting really windy up here too. Might rain. Who knows? On the contract. I have that I deliver all of the images in six weeks. So that is what I tell my couples that I deliver these images in six weeks, but I would say I'm never more than three or four weeks. So if I deliver the images, usually four weeks is the latest that I would deliver them, but it says six on the, on the, or on the contract. So make sure that you under promise over deliver. I think in all aspects of business, I think it's just a, a good thing to be doing. And then the last, the last tip, the most important tip, I think, 100% um, the most important tip, and especially if you're just getting started now and you want to figure out how to take your business from not shooting a whole lot of weddings to shooting a heck of a lot of weddings, it is to be completely in control of your portfolio right now, which means to start creating all the shoots that you would want to get paid for someday. So all the wedding shoots that you want to do, if you want to start shooting, like if you want to do a diner wedding, if you want to do um, like an old school diner wedding, uh, if you want to do like something at like a strange garden that's in, in your local area, if you want to do something that's just like hyper crazy creative, that's all in neon, go out and, and shoot that, figure out how to make that happen. Hire models if you have to, it's part of your portfolio. I feel like this is an investment into your business. And I think that looking back, um, I don't know if it was ego or what it was, but for a long time I was like, oh, like I don't pay people to go in front of my camera. I'm doing them a service by creating images for them. But if the value is all on your side, if you need these images for your business to be successful, really stop at nothing to, to make sure that that happens. And if that means investing some money into making that happen, um, by all means, I would say that that is a, a totally a, a thing that you should be doing. And it's a thing that I did not do for many, many years. Um, I would say that the turning point in my photography career was when I was going from concerts into weddings and I was trying to make that transition and I had a portfolio, but I had a portfolio that was not related to weddings. Uh, I shot a few weddings and I got a few free weddings off of Craigslist of all places. And they they were okay, they, they existed in my portfolio. It proved that I had been to a wedding, which was great. But the turning point really was when I got in touch with a bunch of my friends from the music industry and I very difficult it was difficult in a few cases but I convinced them to just let me do a photo like a photo shoot with the two of them uh, a few different couples those were the images that really helped me step step outside of kind of what the industry was doing and actually become my, my own self I guess um, and with that I became a little bit different than everything that was going on here and that I was in a more complete control direction of my portfolio, which meant that by creating those images, I was now starting to attract more people like that, which meant that I was just now shooting weddings and I was doing a couple shoots for people that were like quite similar to my friends, but I just hadn't met them yet. And I think overall, like as far as happiness goes in, in the wedding industry, that it can be a place that you burn out very quickly, but if you're doing photo sessions with people that are your friends that you just literally haven't met yet, it really is one of the greatest careers that you can ever be part of. So uh, hopefully you've, you've gotten a lot of value out of this. This, this turned out, I thought this was gonna be a 10 minute video. This was uh, much longer than a 10 minute video. So thanks for being here. I do really appreciate it. And if you are interested in getting on the new website, there are some founder spots still available 100 total so if you want to get in and it comes down to basically six dollars and 58 cents if you sign up for the annual per month uh, which is absolutely crazy and you have instant access to all of my presets and as i mentioned my contract and pricing and like all kinds of different stuff there's just have a look over there there's there's more than you could ever really imagine uh, and it really will help you on your way to becoming a wedding photographer there's thousands of patreon members that have already kind of attested to this there's a lot of testimonials and a lot of people that have been doing that they were maybe doing okay or they they had in some cases like they had not even ever thought of getting into weddings they came across a few of my videos somehow and now they're on this this direction to become a wedding photographer and they're actually booking a lot of work and um, i've seen photographers go from something like two or three weddings a year just kind of struggling to get by and to even make enough money to buy lenses to businesses that are now shooting 50 60 um, one studio is actually doing, I think, 127 weddings this year, um, or maybe not this year, but maybe next year now, uh, as a two-person studio. So uh, there is a lot of value in there, and I do believe that it will help you. So if you're interested, sign up for one of those 100 spots, because once they're gone, they're gone forever. And it's similar to the way that Patreon kind of began, that there was a founding member rate when there was just this much content on, and then as more and more content gets added, it gets more and more expensive. So um, just know that if you're signing up now, now is the best time to sign up for it. And then also with the new website, it, it basically got rid of all the things that I didn't like about Patreon. The, the main thing that I didn't like about Patreon, there's a few. So the one, 
organizing course content and creating individual standalone courses like Off Camera Flash for wedding photography or um, Introvert's Guide to, to Posing, it's very difficult for me to put that on Patreon and make it in a way that's just easy. It's like all blog format. Um, so that was annoying. Now everything's just easy to find and easy to track your progress and which videos you've watched and which ones you haven't. And then the other thing that I didn't love was that if you signed up on like today, that you would get charged again on the first of the month. So if you're watching this at the end of the month, end of July, it would charge you again on August 1st. Um, and I, there was nothing I could do about that. So um, new website, a lot better and get it on that founder deal while you still can. And hopefully this was helpful for you. And uh, I'm gonna go and enjoy the rest of the day. You gotta move, you can't lose. Get in the groove, you can't lose. Speed bumps only make you aware. It starts in your heart, so reach for the stars. You know you got charm, you can't do no harm. 